So welcome, thank you for joining us today for our spotlight with Paul Edwards. So Paul is a first year student at Bristol University. Hi Paul, thank you for being here. Hi, it's wonderful Hello. to be here Amber. Thank you. Um, so Paul, do you mind telling us um, a bit about yourself before you started medicine? Yeah, so I'll start with the fact I'm mature student at Bristol. I'm 28. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, mature, but not as mature as some other students. Mm -hmm. So Prior to going to Bristol, I was born in quite a deprived area of Bristol mm -hmm. um, with very little university achievement and attainment. And I actually went to, I think at the time was the second worst school in the city. Um, it was pretty poor. Mm -hmm. And I progressed from there. Um, I went to my sixth form, which was North Bristol Post 16 Centre, which some people might know. And I had a, a really severe accident on a motorbike when I was 17 which meant I needed years of convalescence. And that's what put me back as to why I'm a mature student. Um, so yeah, I just had a kind of a long trip. Then I thought, did a couple of things here and there. The things I've wanted to do in life that weren't medicine, but I could still do. And I did those and sat down at the age of 25 and thought, it's medicine time now, mm -hmm. it's time to go. And then here I am. Yeah, okay. So quite a lot going on there. So if we start back at your schooling, so you talk about it being um, a school that in like a deprived area and quite low progression rate, I imagine, to university. Was that a barrier in itself or because there's obviously there was a few challenges during your school time leading you through. Was the education itself, do you feel like um, a barrier or did you actually find that you came out of the education system um, with your qualifications kind of enough to progress and it was the accident that um, added time on when you progressed to education? Hmm. I think I think I came out with enough. I am yeah. very lucky in that I'm not quite sure if they do it anymore because it's been many years, but back in those days, they had what was called a gifted and talented program, yeah. which is where they took students who they perceived to be gifted and talented in art, sciences mm -hmm. or whatever and paid for them to do certain things like um they paid for me to attend Clifton College in later years and stuff like that yeah. um and the biggest thing for me the education education was difficult um mm -hmm. but the biggest thing for me were teachers I had okay. teachers who were really invested who mm -hmm. I remember my science teacher at the time used to take us for hot chocolate in Clifton and do coursework mm -hmm. with us um my math teacher would sit down and do a lot of work with us and that was what made it happen and I think that mm -hmm. teachers really do make the school um mm -hmm. without them it would have been very different and mm -hmm. so whilst my education was good I had teachers and the program elders may not have felt the same way and I think it's important we get that up for everyone yeah yeah, absolutely. Because I think there's um, programs now as well that Bristol University do, such as Access to Bristol, um, which takes students from select schools and um, gives them experience in the university. Mm -hmm. OK, um, so after. Um, so how old were you when you started your first undergrad degree? Um, and that was at Bristol, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. So I started mm -hmm. Bristol at the age of. 25, I think. Okay. So it's the okay. seven, 17, 16, 17 academic year or 17, yeah. 18. Okay. Um, so I was 25 then and I finished. So the year before I did medicine. So, okay. Yeah. And what was that degree in? Neuroscience. Neuroscience. The, okay. Yeah. The Faculty of Physiology, Pharmacology, and Neuroscience, which mm -hmm. are fantastic. Um, some super, super enthusiastic people in that faculty. And had medicine been something that you already had in mind when you chose that degree? Um, or was it kind of where you just had an interest in science? It was a mix of both, really. I, I had always wanted to do medicine at in some point in my life. However, when I, when I originally applied, I honestly, there's a lot of self-doubt in there. Like, am mm -hmm. I good enough for this? Yep. And I wasn't really sure. Mm -hmm. I applied to a few other places and... Bristol gave me a spot for neuroscience and I always wanted to study at Bristol from when I was a child I was born here so mm -hmm. it was always kind of like I went 
a slight anecdote. I went to mm-hmm. the earthquake lab at Bristol when I was about 11 or 12 during mm-hmm. a summer school. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. I want to come here. Mm-hmm. So I played to Bristol, did an neuroscience program. And yeah, I think if I'd applied, if I'd have applied, I might have gotten in perhaps, mm-hmm. who knows. But um, I didn't think I felt quite ready or prepared enough to do it. And that was the reason I didn't apply. Yeah. Okay. So it was during the neuroscience degree that you started to think, yeah, okay, this could be, this could be something I start to work Mm. towards. Absolutely. And um, I had a lot of experience. So at Bristol, the neuroscience program is in the faculty of Phys Farm Neuro. Mm -hmm. So your degree is 120 credits is split roughly three ways between physiology, pharmacology, and neuroscience. Mm -hmm. And I found that in the neuroscience program, especially in second year, there's a lot of patient directed content, such as what techniques do we use to diagnose? What are we looking for in patients? And Mm -hmm. I found that incredibly interesting. And during a bit of, I want to say work experience, but um, volunteering at the GP surgery, volunteering with the ambulance service, I decided Mm -hmm. that patients were for me. That's what Mm -hmm. I enjoyed the most, that kind Mm -hmm. of personal connection. Because don't get me wrong, it was fun being in a lab and doing research, but the Mm -hmm. patient stuff was far more interesting to me. Yeah, definitely. So that volunteering, was that during your degree or pre-degree? During my degree. I did some beforehand as well, but Mm -hmm. most of it was during. Yeah. And was that volunteering kind of particularly with an application to medicine in mind, or was that just generally to to get the experience to to do the volunteering? A mix of both. So I I definitely did some just on on my own back. So you have things like St. John's and all that kind of stuff, but Mm -hmm. um some of it was with a view of medicine in mind, getting experience. So kind of, yep. um, I did some uh, shifts with my sister, who is a hazardous mm-hmm. rescue paramedic. Wow. And um, I said, can I just come along with you, Zoe? And yeah. she's like, yeah, sure, no worries. Doesn't so, sound um, dangerous got... at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fun. great fun. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, getting the experience of being in healthcare because working long hours, working in those shifts were never quite predictable. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, I actually really enjoy this. So mm-hmm. that was more of a kind of focus towards medicine and volunteering. Yeah. And how much influence did it have being a patient yourself um, when you were younger? Pretty significant. I met some Mm -hmm. fantastic people during my medicine journey um, and they're all inspiring. And Mm -hmm. I spent so much time either as an inpatient or an outpatient under the care of various medics. And I always felt like they had time for me and I wanted Mm -hmm. to be able to do that for other people, especially Mm -hmm. because it makes a real difference in life. I know that My GP, for example, I've had the same GP since I was born. Mm -hmm. I've always had the same GP. And um, he knows me very well. And his support was fantastic. So, yeah, that was that was a very key aspect. And I'm looking forward to um, the person who did my surgery during my Mm -hmm. after my accident teaches at Bristol. No way. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I, I'm looking forward to being lectured by him, being like, yes, you, you've operated on me. Nice to meet you again. Yeah. So, <laughs> Do you know what year that you're, they're going to teach? It's usually third because he okay. teaches okay. on um, fractures, fracture okay. healing and surgery. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. That would be uh, that'd probably be really nice, actually, for mm-hmm. um, you to reach out and talk to him. Mm. Okay. So you're when you're applying to medicine, you're coming in as a science grad, which seems... Mm-hmm obviously a fairly more typical route but actually looking at your background before that that's quite um yeah a non-traditional route into education so how did you find your actual original application to neuroscience oh it was uh, completely smooth because I happened to luck out in the sense that I did my GCSEs which makes things so significantly smoother okay um once I, I did my A-levels, I had my accident just after my, uh, you, you might know this, I don't know anymore, but, but after my AS levels, I don't know if they still do them. Um, you did what knows? I did, but that's not <laughs> saying much. Um. Um, so I did my AS levels, then I had my accident, and that mm-hmm. I meant I couldn't continue. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried again a few years later and found that the pain was too bad. I couldn't do mm-hmm. it, so it took a bit more time. And after that, I did my access to higher education and that was at City of Bristol College for access to science and engineering. And because that's a level equivalent, that really streamlined the process, mm-hmm. which made it a lot easier, thankfully. Otherwise, if you are coming from a purely non-traditional background, such as no GCSEs, no qualifications, mm-hmm. then you're going on kind of a holistic approach and it's mm-hmm. a significantly more difficult. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, perfect. So yeah, so it was a general access course, which then got you onto the neuroscience course. And then once you had that, your application to medicine was then actually looking more, you know, along more along the traditional route of a science background, I suppose, once mm -hmm. you got to that stage. Absolutely. And um, I will say that for the, the actual application to Bristol for, for medicine, my degree meant nothing. Okay. Um, yeah. It's because it's an undergrad mm -hmm. program. They, yeah. they don't look at any further education. Um, mm -hmm. That's why my offer in the end was unconditional, because they said mm -hmm. you've already got your A-level results. Yeah. So here mm -hmm. you go, official place. <laughs> yeah. OK, so the access course itself was applicable to your medicine application because yeah. I think there's there are some particular access to healthcare courses aren't there um, mm. but this one also counted for medicine. Yes um, so my mom's access science engineering there are access to health and social care access to nursing mm -hmm. um, things like that but a uh, big props to Bristol they are one of the early adopters of access courses as a mm -hmm. way of educa education and mm -hmm. as a university that tends to love mature students regardless um, mm -hmm. I'm glad they are because they bring in some fantastic students via this via this particular route. Yeah, I think they do have a, a number of different a kind of I suppose widening participation um, schemes that help to bring in a yeah more diverse group of people from different backgrounds. Um, yeah, which makes it good for me to get to interview lots of different people. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay, perfect. So we've got now to your medicine application. So were you in your third year of neuroscience when you decided to apply? Yes. Yeah. How did you find yeah. that balancing oh, was, um, third year with an application? It was interesting. Project time was curious. Um, I did, as um, I will say, I didn't to be enjoy my project very much, but um, mm. yeah, it's difficult. But I got it all done out of the way towards the start because the deadline is so late for applying. Mm. Uh, sorry, sorry, early, 15th mm. of October. Once I decided to apply, I was like, oh God, I've got to book the UCAT. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually sat my UCAT on the last day that it was available to sit, okay. um, which was like tight. Um, mm -hmm. Because I have, I don't know what they call it at other universities, but at Bristol, we have what are called disability support summaries, mm -hmm. which is where you have things such as extra time in your exams mm -hmm. or whatever. And that qualified me for what they call the U UCAT SEN. So you got mm -hmm. extra time or whatever. Mm -hmm. I tried to book this and Pearson said, sorry, we don't have space. We, you, you have to do the normal one. We, unless, if you don't do the normal one, you can't do it. So mm -hmm. I ended up having to do the normal one, which was quite annoying. But um, yeah. it was on the last day, made it happen. So with that and the university balancing was quite difficult, but mm -hmm. um, definitely possible. Yeah, okay. Um, and then, so we've said that your degree, you know, on paper, didn't count towards the application but how did you basically utilize your past experience you know to put into your application to medicine both academic so, I suppose and past experience yeah so I have the the advantage of having been at uni for three <laughs> years which is pretty significant um <laughs> I will say and in terms of the application my personal statement focused a lot on my my personal experience of the healthcare sector and what mm -hmm. I want to how I was treated and how I want to treat patients that way and mm -hmm. that was part of, a large part of my personal statement which was um, very helpful I think mm -hmm. and just bringing the kind of thoughtful skills to interviews because interviews are mm -hmm. by in my opinion by far the most difficult part of the process um, mm -hmm. um and sitting down and thinking, oh God, what are they going to ask me? Have I overprepared? Have I underprepared? Mm -hmm. But that kind of time spent doing presentations at university, doing mm -hmm. these group work sessions has maybe gave me that ability to sit down and think, no, relax, it's fine. The questions mm -hmm. you, you have prepared. And I'm, it, it gave me the ability to actually answer them calmly, which I think helps a lot. And mm -hmm. admissions tutors can see if you've overprepared a mile away. Mm -hmm. um so just be yourself and that allowing me to be myself I think was what got me in yeah I suppose that confidence in just being you know having to speak in front of people and speaking to mm -hmm. different people that you're not familiar with um it definitely builds over time absolutely and when you're in school especially sixth form often you will be in your classes and mm -hmm. maybe not so now with covid but you'll be in your mm -hmm. classes and you don't really venture out that outside, outside that very much for your friend groups, your classes, whereas in 
university every year I do a group project with nobody I'd never I'd never even met them before and yeah. you have to get on you have to talk you have to manage mm-hmm. and that is a key skill that will not only last you forever in medicine but mm-hmm. it's good to develop as soon as you can and that's definitely advantageous for the application process. Mm-hmm. And in terms of your other applications um, you said you'd always wanted to study at Bristol and you obviously got that chance doing neuroscience were you quite open to moving away to study somewhere else or was Bristol still your top choice? Um, my friends make fun of me because mm. I didn't apply to anywhere else. Okay. I only applied to Bristol okay. for the okay, one, the one, <laughs> yes, yep. the one program at the one university. And um, mm-hmm. the reason for that is my family is here. Mm-hmm. You know, my partner's yep. here and I mm-hmm. don't want to move away for what could be four to five years. Um, mm-hmm and be away from my family for long periods mm-hmm. admittedly we're in the UK if I go to Southampton or Warwick or Barts or wherever um mm-hmm. it's a short drive home but it's still a barrier and it's not something I wanted to introduce so mm-hmm. I made the bold slash silly maybe stupid depending on how you look at it step yeah <laughs> well, it's worked one. out yeah it's worked out oh, so calculated mm-hmm. yeah yeah I think it's one of those things where especially because it's such a long course and because you know potentially people at different you know stages or experiences their life it does make a much bigger um impact where you are location wise it's not always so easy to just you know travel halfway across the country or or go to a new place so Uh, absolutely it's correct and for for example i have a friend who now is at um st george's Mm -hmm. and for his placements he can be in Brighton or he can be up north of London he can be Mm -hmm. in so many places but at least for me it's just kind of it was a big aspect where I might be in North Bristol South Bristol or I might end up in Taunton but it's not to be far it's I can it's on a motorway I can get home if I need to so Mm -hmm. yeah that was a key aspect to applying to Bristol other than everything else but of course if you want to be one of those people who wants to go yeah let's travel the world let's travel the UK (laughs) then other places might be better for you yeah absolutely I think that's a great thing about medicine as well you know you have so many opportunities your foundation program um you can you know you can travel pretty much anywhere um as a doctor or as part of like affiliate program so it's definitely exactly. a good career for that that's something I'm looking forward to because I know once I've graduated my family are still here and I, I would like to travel a bit because mm-hmm. you have things that you have such things such as MSF and all of that once you've done your yeah. foundation program and mm-hmm. we are lucky in that our degree fundamentally allows us to work anywhere in the world mm-hmm. um, and be recognized in doing so so mm-hmm. it's a fantastic uh, program and degree for that yeah um so how how has it been going how is how is first year um I will I'll begin that conversation by prefacing for anyone in the future yeah my first year is in the COVID era so yeah. it's hard to kind of generalize mm-hmm. um to other years that may not be in the midst of a global pandemic but mm-hmm. in general yeah it's been fantastic I think that mm-hmm. given the restrictions we've had to work to so just to quickly cover it mm-hmm. in-person teaching is heavily restricted because of uh, the risk of COVID transmission um mm-hmm. having to wear a mask and social distance makes it harder but not impossible um I was lucky in that I met my tutor group in person before the restrictions really hit Mm -hmm. which gave us an advantage of being able to get to know each other prior Mm -hmm. but overall fantastic I don't know I'll define it so in Bristol most of our teaching in that sense is done by a case-based learning or CBL Mm -hmm. and I'm of the opinion that really there's no difference in in the kind of pedagogical sense of mm-hmm. CBL. It works brilliantly mm-hmm. online. It's very focused and I've met some fantastic people doing it, which is all done in our tutor group. And our WhatsApp chat is full of jokes and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff constantly. So mm-hmm. the teaching has been okay in the sense that obviously it's all been online, tech problems, mm-hmm. and there's a lot to cover. Mm-hmm. And without the kind of direction of missing of going to lectures and going to labs because Mm -hmm. in my first year oddly enough I actually for the first year medicine program I've done almost all the bio labs already because I did them in neuroscience (laughs) so I think ah, I remember that um Mm -hmm. being able to go in and keeping the schedule of getting the pre-lab done lab and then post lab it's been a very difficult transition to just having that online just thinking oh do I do I have a lab this week I'm not really sure compared Mm -hmm. to just going in but 
overall, it's a solid eight out of ten. For within mm -hmm. the restrictions, they've they've done a very good job. Um, there's still just a lot to cover. Yeah. The, the yeah. um, the 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 level of you think, oh, this isn't too bad, but then, um, you look at the amount of slides you have, and it's a lot, mm -hmm. but it's not impossible if you, yeah. Mm -hmm. And are you finding your, you know, you've just said you've done a lot of the labs before, and just in general, are you finding your neuroscience background is is really coming through? Mm, yeah, the, I wouldn't say the neuroscience so much, but the physiology, physiology, yeah. and the pharmacology. Mm -hmm. Um, the pharmacology, because I will be the first to admit, I am awful at biochemistry. Um, I, so I've not been too good at that, but it has given mm -hmm. me a tiny bit of advantage. Um, and the physiology, we did the same anatomy stuff as some of the medics in yeah. first and second year yeah. neuroscience, which means mm -hmm. we're in the dis human dissection rooms using specimens. Mm -hmm. And that has given me a large advantage. So even simple things, like it sounds silly, but... Um, anatomical position anatomical letterings um mm -hmm. how you name things distal medial um mm -hmm. that's really difficult to get through and um to sort of my tutor group and others i've met it's almost like learning a second language yeah and it's very difficult to get into very quickly so i've had the advantage of a few years of that which has helped a lot but um i wouldn't say it's going to carry me much further than the first year <laughs> it gets yeah. it ramps okay. up <laughs> yeah yeah no I would agree with that second language anatomy especially the amount of times I've spent and it's that extra five seconds of okay what does that mean and moving your arm oh, like yeah. what flip, just move yeah <laughs> yeah a lot of it's, slow thinking it, to get there absolutely you know you get the same thing where you're just like what is this muscle oh I don't know extensor must be on yeah. the back um yeah county one two three <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um for me personally as um muscles and bones are the worst because mm -hmm. some of them just are named in ways that don't make any sense yeah or they're yeah how many do you know how many fossils there are in the body a um, lot yeah <laughs> i don't even want to begin to to think about them <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay um and how has it been being you know a mature student a grad on the course do you think i'm just thinking about the way it's set up you know, during the pandemic, do you think it's less noticeable perhaps because I don't know, you've got your limited group contact or yeah, have you found it? So it's different this year because of a pandemic. And I think that mm -hmm. as a mature student, I have noticed a difference between starting the neuroscience program and starting the medical program. Um, I'm a few years older. And as I mentioned to a friend of mine, I'm 10 years older than so my tutor group. Mm -hmm. which is um, quite a significant gap. But everyone on the programme, in my experience, is super, super mature and mm -hmm. just wants to get involved in everything. And mm -hmm. um, I may not understand TikTok, but I am still kind of able to, to cross that bridge, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And they're always inclusive. So as for the pandemic, it does mean that pubs have been shut and clubs have been shut and all that kind of thing. And it's not something I would probably reasonably do um, I think my clubbing days are long past me, but mm -hmm. clubs and things like that would be lovely. And mm -hmm. I think it would be even better were the pandemic not happening. Um, mm -hmm. I also happen to have gotten lucky with my tutor group, yeah. who are all lovely. So yeah, yeah it's, it's difficult, but it's not impossible to cross that bridge, um, mm -hmm. especially as we have some other mature students here. We're all fantastic. Yeah. I think uh, Bristol's about 10% of medical students yeah. are mature. So mm -hmm. there's there's always someone to talk to who's maybe not near your age, but definitely might be from a similar background to you or mm. whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, we've said before that in, you know, normal lecture days, you'd maybe be able to spot who might be a little bit older and you could go seek them out <laughs> and sit next to them to a lecture, whereas you can't, um, you can't really do that, you know, online. You don't necessarily know no. where to find these people. It's been actually one of the big challenges, I suppose, trying to start community um, within you know just not about well, the med school as a whole not just the mature student um community when everyone's quite disparate um because mm. you've been working on some projects for that haven't you um yes been trying mm. to bring the medical students together a little bit mm. either via um we wanted to host competitions and things like mm -hmm. that we have um i don't know if other medical schools are the same but we use microsoft teams mm -hmm. as our kind of connectivity um slash workflow system mm -hmm. and we have 
a Microsoft team set up for the entire year one cohort where they can oh, go and talk okay. Um, okay. if they want to and kind of have mm -hmm. that social aspect. It's free of the, mm, I don't want to say moderation, but it's more kind mm -hmm. of student orientated than mm -hmm. actually ran by academics. We recently set up a medicine Discord server, which will be covering mm -hmm. the five years of the program, plus mm -hmm. gateway and intercalators. Mm -hmm. So our goal is to get as many people as possible across the medical school on, into one place, because mm -hmm. much like other programs, there is a wealth of knowledge to be learned and shared from the fifth years down to the third years and from the first mm -hmm. years up to the third. It's mm -hmm. everyone can teach somebody something and we're trying to bring people as close together as we can. And I think that's still valuable, even in non-pandemic times. I think that mm -hmm. there are times when you just have to think, I want to talk to like-minded people that I may not that I may not necessarily know very closely, but I just like to get mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. And even if it's just ranting about your project, there's always mm -hmm. value in something. And yes, we're trying to do that as best we can. Hopefully we'll push that more over the next couple of months. And mm -hmm. if there's any um, potential applicants, hopefully we'll have it ready for September. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I think my contribution so far has been a picture of a cat and a picture of a dog. <laughs> Which were beautiful, to be fair. They were absolutely yeah. beautiful. Happy birthday to the dog. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so is it, have you been um, part of any other extracurriculars at all? or Because um, this was part of being year one rep, am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. one of the year one course reps, there's six of us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've been trying to set up things like... Um, extracurricular I don't want to say revision sessions study mm -hmm. sessions or groups where you can get together and talk on whatsapp um mm -hmm. competitions chats we host usually fortnightly drop-ins to get mm -hmm. uh, opinions from the students um yeah but it's very difficult because everyone is struggling mm -hmm. and obviously everyone would much rather be doing their own thing or in the sense of just meeting people getting out and having the student life so we're trying to replicate that, but engagement is tough. Um, in my previous night at Bristol, I was the president of a society nice. and um, that was a lot of work, mm -hmm. I must say. Um, it's not something mm -hmm. I'm keen to repeat anytime soon, mm -hmm. but I would definitely recommend getting involved in all the extracurriculars you can. Um, mm -hmm. It will vastly enrich your time. The majority of my closest friends are from societies. Mm -hmm. and And that's not to say, you won't meet anyone on your program this mm -hmm. could be your friend because you will but um you'll find that you might find someone that's very interested in sailing in the sailing society or something and then you will bond mm -hmm. well so yeah extra cooker is pretty big for me and um i would like to do more but i try and find that balance because mm -hmm. i i'd love to know more i'd love to do more medicine and things like that but i personally find that I enrich myself doing other things and mm -hmm. whilst I could strive for those 90% marks that people try and get it's more like mm -hmm. I'd rather get 70 and have a casual more relaxed time. Mm -hmm. Are there any like other extracurriculars you've got your eye on kind of looking in the future years especially when things hopefully return mm -hmm. to kind of more normal times um, anything that yeah um, going forward you'd like to get involved in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I come from a background when I when I was 10, my parents bought me a Mini Cooper and I started okay. racing okay. Mini Coopers. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to cars and carts and all that kind of stuff when I was younger. And I've mm -hmm. always enjoyed racing. So I'm going to try, especially a third and fourth year, I'd love to try and swing an elective in um, kind of emergency medicine yep, at yep. racetracks. Because that mm -hmm. would be fantastic. So, and um, like wilderness medicine I'm a keen rock climber mm -hmm. so if I can get into that kind of like wilderness medicine as well that'd yeah. be really interesting yeah. especially um, somewhere abroad mm -hmm. yeah I think because we do student choice projects which could be maybe a potential and then obviously the, mm. the final year elective so yeah yeah exciting um, and I you're recently a new committee member for a, a new society uh, are you not yeah, I believe. I Oh, I can't remember who set it up. Who set it up? It might be Amber. Amber. Yes, so we recently affiliated a new society. Um, if you're unaware, at Bristol, we have the Medical to Student Society, which is called Galenicals. And Galenicals is a super wide umbrella. 
it has many, many sub societies and sub um, subspecialty societies. And we decided that the mature students should be like its own society because there's so many of us. Um, theoretically, there should be about 120 mm -hmm. of us, 125, maybe more. And Amber very kindly affiliated us with the Students' Union. So we're going to try and have a more mature medic focused society with some events and things like mm -hmm. that going forward, which I'm really excited about. So mm -hmm. mature students are very much welcome here. Yeah, I think also it combines a lot of your work that you were doing for the year ones anyway, mm. and, you know, creating this discord server and, you know, basically working to make community. It's just a smaller subset um, of that work really, isn't it? Yeah, and it's if I'm doing the work in one way, I may as well make it a benefit yeah. as many people as possible. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's my pleasure. And I'm, I'm really hoping it takes off because mm -hmm. whilst we do have a lot of intercommunication, there's a lot of disparate kind of you'll get information in an email from this person mm -hmm. or teams from that person or I'm sure mm -hmm. there are people who are watching this will go especially for some websites I think setting up group chats meeting your friends is a mm -hmm. pain so mm -hmm. being able to have it all in one place welcome come have a look it will be fantastic yeah, yeah hopefully just have to yeah mm -hmm. drive the engagement so thinking about you know how this year has gone is there anything that's surprised you i suppose we've talked about the sheer volume of knowledge or if you were to start again or for, for anyone starting what biggest lesson i suppose have you learned so far or top tip top tip um <laughs> hmm. if you don't use it already and you and you learn well via the system systems mm -hmm. like anki and flashcards will be Mm -hmm. very useful to you I know some people don't learn from them at all and yeah that's that's a personal thing but if you find them useful they'll be very very useful um mm -hmm. another tip is to make friends with the years above you mm -hmm. they have been through what you are going through and mm -hmm. they're not going to be giving you answers but they will give you support and mm -hmm. it's, it's always there and they can always say oh yeah this particular part of this unit is difficult but um here's a website that's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, make the most of it because I, I haven't, I can't speak for medicine yet. And mm -hmm. Amber is far more educated than I am. So she'll be, I just tell you more, but um, <laughs> undergrad, especially for un undergrad for me when yeah. it's an instant, I yeah. still remember sitting in my first lecture at Bristol for my neuroscience degree and thinking, Oh my God, I've made it. This is incredible. Mm -hmm. And that feels like, a day ago and yet it's flown by um mm -hmm. really throw yourself into everything um if you find a society that interests you do it if you want mm -hmm. to uh bristol has a society they go on summer expeditions to places like base camp for everest do it um mm -hmm. just really throw yourself in and and you will enjoy it um whilst they're academically mm, it's a lot of work but it's not impossible if you get into medicine, you can do it. Yeah, it's really that simple. They, you wouldn't be here if they weren't confident that you could do it. And lean on your friends for support because we all struggle. And mm -hmm. you will meet people who are, I think Americans call them gunners, mm -hmm. who just want to know everything. And you will meet people like that. But mm -hmm. um, and we all know that medical students are naturally competitive. They always want to be the best. And yep. A friend of mine told me when I started medicine that comparison is the thief of joy. Yeah. And just do your thing mm -hmm. and you will love it. You will enjoy it. Just make sure you savor it whilst it's here. Yeah, I think it's just, yeah, some really good advice in there. I found myself today actually kind of almost wishing away the rest of the year saying, well, it's only this many weeks till Easter. And then there's only three cases after Easter. And I think it's very easy to do and suddenly the year is gone. But I think mm. um, just, yeah, being in this moment now in this teaching in these um, opportunities uh, is really important because the time does completely fly by. It really does. And I was doing exactly the same thing as you. I was doing my gastrointestinal work today. Mm -hmm. And I thought, so what's the next case? Oh, endocrine. There's only three cases left and mm -hmm. have a couple more things to do. But then the year's over, it's exam time. Yep. And then September's coming. But oh my God, it goes so fast. Yeah. <laughs> you, you'll wake up and think, wow. Um, uh, at Bristol, we don't do, um, for the standard 
programs, they usually have exams in January that count mm -hmm. towards your modules. Mm -hmm. At Bristol of Medicine, you don't. You have the progress test, which you do a couple of times a year, but there's nothing mm -hmm. that actually counts towards your grades. Mm -hmm. So I personally found a lot less pressure in the medical program compared to the traditional modular programs. But mm -hmm. I have a, <laughs> have a, you can't see it, but it's on my desktop. Mm -hmm. I have a countdown to the, to the, the actual exam. Yeah. And it seems to be getting closer and closer very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I swear yesterday it said 160 days and now it's just 105. Mm -hmm. Oh God. So yeah. I completely agree with you. It vanishes. So mm -hmm. be in the here, be in the now. Yeah, I think as well, you know, applies for everyone, but particularly potentially older students who are worried about maybe how old they'll be when they finish or another five years or four years of their life. Um, and yeah, it sounds like a long time, but it really does it it really does go very fast and it might seem daunting going into mm. it. But yeah, it, it oh, goes really fast. Absolutely. <laughs> a friend of mine told me, Why are you starting medicine now? You're twenty eight. Mm -hmm. When you graduate, you'll be thirty. I will say I'll be thirty two because I'll be thirty two for four days once I graduate, okay. but then yeah. I'll be thirty three. Yeah. Um, it counts. But yeah, it counts. Um but I'd be doing in in five years, mm -hmm. I'd be 35 anyway, 32, whatever. Yeah. Um, I'd rather spend that time doing something interesting. And as a doctor, the, the path is so long anyway, mm -hmm. and you'll have great fun doing it. So just throw yeah. yourself in. doesn't matter. Don't worry about the age. Everyone, you'll all get on. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And just to to finish off thinking about the future um, we've talked about a few different areas kind of mm. emergency medicine wilderness are these potential future specialities you're interested in you know are you leaning towards a certain way um yes to be honest um because of my accident i have a large interest in orthopedics yeah. uh, orthopedic surgery mm -hmm. um as the lecturer who also operated on me so fondly called it bone carpentry. Mm -hmm. um, it's super interesting and it's something I'd like to kind of look more into, but mm -hmm. if I'm honest, my true kind of currently specialty love mm -hmm. applies to a subspecialty of emergency medicine called pre-hospital. Okay. So it's, you are an emergency medic. However, mm -hmm. most of your work is done pre-hospital with the mm -hmm. ambulance teams. Mm -hmm. So if they require a doctor for whatever reason mm -hmm. at specific sites, they'll send you. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very small kind of niche team and they integrate with HEMS, which yeah. are quite important and um, mm -hmm. various other teams as well. So importantly for me, I wouldn't be based in hospital and every day would be different. Mm -hmm. So I know every day is different anyway, but I could be mm -hmm. helping someone fall, who's fallen over one day out of their shower or the next mm -hmm. day I could be at a trauma center. Who knows? And mm -hmm. that's probably my chosen specialty. But of course, it's several years away. Several, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who knows? I'm, um, I might get really into general practice by the time I get there. Who knows? Yeah, I think it's good to be open-minded, but I think it's just always interesting seeing, you know, potentially people's previous experiences or, you know, mm. people have had longer to think about their interests um, often when they're a bit older. So, I, yeah, I love hearing about what people uh yeah absolutely. where their interests lie yeah it's, it's absolutely i completely agree and it's medicine is a really broad church mm -hmm. there's i don't remember off the top of my head i think it's something like 85 specialties in the uk mm -hmm. it's, it's large and mm -hmm. you can flip flop between them and indeed a lot of my friends do flip flop between them but mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to go anywhere and that's one of the things i love about the program is you're not pigeonholed mm -hmm. and everything is exciting and you'll make a world of difference no matter what specialty you're in. I think that's a lovely sentiment um, to finish on there. So mm -hmm. thank you very much, Paul, for your time today and for sharing your journey. I think it's going to be interesting for a lot of people. And yeah, if I ever get fall down a, a mountainside, perhaps uh, you'll be on the um, receiving end of my care. <laughs> Possibly. Maybe. I, I hope not. <laughs> yeah. <But>. yeah. <laughs> thank you, Amber. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much.